Persol and Verilux are teaming up for the ideal eyewear fit. Combining timeless design with progressive lenses, iconic style meets unparalleled vision performance, making the extraordinary effortless. Discover Verilux and Persol and find your local Essilor expert at Essilor.com. Curious about how you can achieve smooth, natural-looking, long-lasting filler results? The Juvederm Collection of Fillers has six unique gel fillers that add subtle volume and are designed for different needs in specific areas of the face, like lips, cheeks, chin, smile lines, under eyes, and jawline. Ask your licensed specialist for a full face assessment today and download the Alley app, that's A-L-L-E, the official loyalty program of Juvederm, to save on treatments and get a look that's true to you. For important safety information and to find a licensed specialist, visit Juvederm.com. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Not for people with severe allergic reactions, allergies to lidocaine, or the proteins used in Juvederm. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. There's a risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. Talk to a licensed specialist to find out if it's right for you. Wes Craven redefined horror and birthed a new kind of terror with his creation of Freddy Krueger, the disfigured dream stalker who haunts the nightmares of teenagers on Elm Street. But just when you thought it was safe to fall asleep again, Freddy returned with a vengeance in this 80s flick sequel. This time, he's got his sights set on a new victim, Jesse Walsh, who discovers that his nightmares are all too real when Freddy attempts to take over his body. So unpack those moving boxes, stay out of the locker room showers, and watch out for exploding birds as Laramie Wells and I discuss A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, from 1985 on this episode of the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. They told her it was just a bad dream. She knew it was real. It became a nightmare on Elm Street. Now there's a new kid on Elm Street. And Freddy's been waiting. I'm afraid to go to sleep. We'll stay up all night if we have to. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Freddy's back. (laughs) And this time he's not fooling around. You are all my my children children now. A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 2, Freddy's Revenge. It's coming soon. Watch out for it. I'm Tim Williams, the mastermind behind the mic at the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. Joining me on each epic episode is a guest co-host who's as crazy about 80s flicks as they are about wearing parachute pants and solving Rubik's Cubes. We're diving into nostalgic treasures we saw at the local theater, rented on VHS tapes, or discovered on cable TV. From blockbusters that make you say, I feel the need, the need for speed. To hidden gems that'll have you screaming, More here. It's a blast to relive these old memories and share our thoughts on what made these movies so special. We reminisce about our first time watch experiences, share our favorite scenes, and even discover fascinating behind the scenes tales about the cast and crew along the way. Haven't hit that subscribe button yet? What are you waiting for? Come on, do it! On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And hey, while you're at it, be a pal and drop us a written review along with a five-star rating to tell us what you think about us. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, they all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. Take a day off and come hang out with us on social media. Just search 80s Flick Flashback on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And don't forget to bookmark 80sflickflashback.com for more gnarly content. 
Get out of town. I didn't know you did anything creative. Want to crank it all the way up to 11? Become a supporter on buymeacoffee.com for only $5 a month. Do or do not. There is no try. Click the link in our episode show notes. And while you're there, soak up the extra trivia and fun stuff that didn't make it into today's show. Thanks again for tuning in. Now, let's get right into today's episode. Welcome to the party, pal. All right, well, welcome in, everybody. So glad to have you on this episode of the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. And it's going to be a fun one tonight. Maybe not the best movie uh, ever made or the best horror movie ever made or the best of this franchise that was made, but we will do our best to talk about it, whether we liked it or no, didn't I'd like it. No, I'd rather talk about it. <laughs> So welcome back to the epi- to the uh, show, Mr. Laramie Wells from Moving Panels Podcast. How you doing, Laramie? Uh, Tim, why can't I wake up like a normal person? <laughs> Do you wake up screaming at the top of your lungs every time you wake up? Yes, like a scared child. Yes, yes. Every night. Blood curdling screams. That, I mean, obviously doesn't affect the neighbors because they... They, nobody ever comes to check on it besides the parents. Look, nobody in this movie thinks that sound affects anybody. It's <laughs> like the kids at the party just waiting for the light to go out. And then, yeah, hey, exactly. Let's, let's turn up the music and right, right, and and all. Not like the parent, or I do at least like that they acknowledge the parents hear it. Yes, yeah. And then there's a quick shot where he's got the pillow over his head, uh, like the one of the last shots of the parents when their things are going crazy downstairs. Yeah. Anyway. But yeah, so uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, which is already a confusing title because who's he taking revenge on? Nobody from the first movie comes back to this movie, but nope. uh, we'll get there. Uh, but when did you see Nightmare on Elm Street 2 for the very first time? Oh, you know me. I saw it on television many, <laughs> many years ago. I can't I can't tell you exactly when. It was just one yeah. of those, when when all of those movies would pop up on television on a mm-hmm. you know Saturday afternoon or something. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I know. Like we've talked about this one. This is the this is the franchise that I most remember from my middle school years. Um, but I don't think like I know I didn't see the first one until much later. I don't think I even saw this one until maybe a couple of years ago, because when I watched it the first time a couple of years ago, I didn't really remember any of it. Maybe like a few scenes that people had told me about, or maybe I'd like caught a clip or something. Uh, you know, part bits and pieces on cable or something. But um, I think I didn't come in until like three or four was when I really started getting into the, uh, into the Freddy movies, but yeah, but that's when they got fun. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's why this I was able one, to not fun. No, uh, not fun on purpose or not funny on purpose, but they're definitely. Yeah. Uh, but the first one wasn't funny and still no. good. Right. Right. Yeah. This yeah. This was just... definitely a, a step down. So. Yeah. Uh, so when did you last see it before we watching it for the podcast? Uh, it's probably been a couple of years. I, I am a big fan of both night round Elm street and Friday the 13th. So any mm-hmm. chance I get to watch them, <laughs> I will. Right. Uh, you know, e- even if it's me pulling out my DVDs and, mm-hmm. uh, and watching them myself, but obviously with small children, it's, it's probably been, <laughs> yeah. you know, a, a good decade. Since I've seen it, though. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I think I saw it for the first time a couple of years ago. Um, so that's the last time I watched it. So it was still it was still pretty fresh. I know uh, uh, Nicholas and I had talked about the introduction of this scene was very similar to the introduction of License to Drive. So we put, put that comparison of the school bus driver kind of going off kilter or whatever. So it was we were wondering, like, which because they came out, I think. License Drive came out a year or two after. So like maybe they stole that from that. But yeah, let's just let's just go. Let's just go to <laughs> pre-production and story origin. So pre-production for Nightmare on Elm Street 2 began in April of 1985. Screenwriter Leslie Boehm pitched the producers with his idea of using pregnancy and possession as a plot device for the second film. He said, my concept was an homage to Rosemary's Baby. I came up with a plot that had a new family move into the house a teenage boy, his pregnant mother, and a stepfather the boy didn't get along with. It was a real bloody, scary idea, much more physical and realistic because the dream reality stuff was less central to the movies then. My story was more of a possession scenario with Freddy getting inside the mother's womb, controlling the fetus. But New Line passed on it because 
the executive Sarah Risher was pregnant at the time and I understand the idea of setter. So they went with David Shaskin's concept instead. Though both films ended up using the spirit possession concept, the pregnancy idea would eventually be used in the sequel, A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, which Boehm could, would write the script for. Which is only slightly better than this one. <laughs> right. So uh, Robert Shea offered Wes Craven the chance to direct again, but he turned down the offer since he had many problems with the script, such as the quote-unquote possessed parakeet that seemed very ridiculous to him and us, uh, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. and of Freddie merging with the main character and manifesting in real life at the pool party to kill scores of teenagers, of which many yep. are bigger than him, yep. which Craven thought would diminish Freddie's scare factor because Robert England is not, a very, is not very tall in stature. So Jack yeah. Shoulder, who had previously written and directed Alone in the Dark for New Line, was offered to direct. In a 2020 interview, he explained he had no interest in making horror films and that his initial feeling was to turn Robert Shea down. After realizing that this could put him on the map as a director, he said yes. And he also said later that he was not a fan of the first movie, which is why he decided to go so far removed from the what Freddie could and couldn't do. So. He must not have divulged that he wasn't a fan of the first movie in order to get this job. <laughs> no, no, that came out much, much later. <laughs> much, much later. Uh, man, why would you agree to do it, though, if you're not a fan, if you weren't a fan of the first one? Yeah. I guess he just he thought like, maybe his idea would would mm -hmm. continue the franchise, but man. No. Well, like I said, you know, he's trying to he's trying to get make his career as a director, so he's just kind of taking whatever he can get hoping to get noticed yeah. for the next next project. So principal photography commenced in June of 85. Director Jack Shoulder said in an interview that he had very, very little time to prepare and that the movie contained a lot of special effects, none of which I knew how to do. <laughs> the film's special <laughs> effects were headed by Kevin Yeager, who handled Freddy's design, and Mark Showstrom, who's responsible for the transformation effects wherein Freddy comes out of Jesse's body. David yeah. B. Miller, who created the makeup in the original film, was too busy working on Cocoon and My Science Project instead. Jaeger only had a few pictures and the original film as reference, so he redesigned Freddy's look. Studying pictures of burn victims, he made changes to Freddy's look, namely by bringing out the facial bones. He said his intent was to make Freddy look like a male witch and gave Freddy red and amber eyes to make him more demonic looking. In a later interview, Jaeger expressed disappointment and confusion regarding the ending of the film <laughs> the ending there's yeah, yeah there's just so that part. much about this that just that makes part. no sense i didn't mind the you know i i get yeah different look of freddy mm -hmm. i didn't mind it there are some times where he just doesn't look right yeah but my biggest thing is and i get that it's supposed to be he's he's part of jesse whatever it is but they pretty much just took away the glove and the, yeah, yeah, the the blades just come straight out of his fingers, mm -hmm. and I didn't like that at all. Yeah, yeah, it's really it's hard to watch at times because, like you said, especially if you've seen all the movies and really know you know Freddy's character, this just yeah. doesn't seem like a Freddy movie. It seems like no, a very cheap. It's copy. not a Freddy movie, right? Yeah, it's it's like a cheap copy that it's some know, other movie that they put Freddy Krueger into. Right, exactly. Yeah, it, it just it does. Yeah, it's just it's just weird because it doesn't even <laughs> follow the Freddy mythology that was exactly. Craven right. right worked on, and that the other directors would you know mm -hmm. would actually care to follow. I mean, there is not a single dream death in this movie. No, no, which is not really a weird. Single dream death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even the dream sequences aren't really that scary like it's you know they're just i, I guess they try to be in certain certain parts but it's like it's it's there feels like there's so much trying to set up and create this anticipation or this you know um you know waiting for something to happen but it doesn't really ever pay off no in the dreams what, but there no what dream the only dream that we know of is the uh bus at the beginning and at the end. There's no other dreams. I'm trying to think. Was there another one? No, everything no, else everything happens he's, in real yeah. life. Yeah, but you would. Yeah, because and I know there were times in the movie I was watching, like, is he dreaming now or not? 
but he wasn't. It was just like I guess Freddy taking over his body, yeah, and him going and committing Freddy, the murders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freddy's more like a poltergeist in this. Right, one. right. Yeah, everything is you know the the stuff with the coach, you know that's all mm -hmm. in real life. Right, the, right. Yeah, the the stuff that, um, man, I, Lisa experiences in the the factory that mm -hmm. that is all happening yeah, in real yeah, life. Yeah, because that was the part that I really was shaking my head at the end. I was like okay, she's not dreaming. So how no. is she seeing all this? Like, it, yeah, it's just, it's just no. yeah. Yeah, even even when his friend watches, you would think that when his friend falls asleep mm -hmm. and then Freddy, you know, crawls out of his body, that, no, that's happening that was, in real right. life. Right. There's There are no dream sequences other than the <laughs> bus scene at the beginning and then mm -hmm. you would assume the bus scene at the end. At the end, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's crazy. I didn't put that together that well. That's because the movie's so confusing. <laughs> because it's not Freddy. And then, I mean, I don't know if you want to go ahead and get into this. Is is it Freddy killing these people? Or is it Jesse killing these people? It's obviously Jesse being, you know, quote unquote, you know, possessed by Freddy. But then... Do the people see Jesse or do they see yes, Freddy? That's, that's what that, I that, and that's what I want to know. Right, right. And then what did his friend see then? Yeah. If right. Yes. The, it's it makes no sense. <laughs> and then all that at the end, you're just like, you know, yeah, again, I get you're supposed to maybe believe it's a dream at the end, but you know, I'm pretty sure that Jesse's the authorities are gonna have to speak to Jesse. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. The fact that they just, yeah, the, the, there's no police presence other mm -hmm. than them no. bringing him home right. from finding him walking down the road. Right, right. There's, yeah, there's no like, wait, uh, Jesse and your, the your coach, mm -hmm. and y'all were seen together. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, oh my goodness, this is, <laughs> this is a bad movie, <laughs> and I love Freddy Krueger. This is a bad movie. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to put you through this. And now, these messages. Are you a fan of movies and TV shows inspired by comics? Ready for a podcast that dives deep into the thrilling world of adaptations? Well, look no further. Welcome to Moving Panels, the podcast where we discuss movies and TV shows based on, inspired by, and adapted from the world of comic books. This is your go-to podcast for all things comics on screen. I'm your host, Laramie Wells, and every Monday we explore the dynamic universe where ink meets action. We break down the classics, reveal hidden gems, and uncover the creative process behind your favorite adaptations. Subscribe to Moving Panels now on your favorite podcast platform and join us on this epic journey through the pages of comics and onto the big screen. Remember, new episodes drop every Monday. Don't miss out. Moving Panels, where every panel has a story, Every adaptation is a blockbuster. Subscribe today, and I'll see you on the other side of the page. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into casting and move on down the line here. So Robert Shea, head of New Line Cinema, wanted to play the role of, John, of Ron. Oh, I think I meant to put this at the end, but I'll say it now. Robert Shea, the head of New Line Cinema, wanted to play the role of Ron Grady's father, but was denied by director Jack Shoulder, who gave him the non-speaking role of the bartender at the S&M bar that Jesse visits. Shea would later recall and never sleep again that his leather outfit was purchased from L.A. store, The Pleasure Chest. That, meant, that was into me at the end of the casting, but there you go. A little sneak peek yeah. there. Yeah. Robert Shea uh, can't act, so I no. know I'm good with him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he makes uh, cameos in he, other... Yeah, and I'm other, fine with uh, his cameos. You know, like his cameo yeah. here is the bartender. I'm yeah. I'm fine with his cameos, but no, I don't want to see. I've yeah. seen Robert Shea act. I don't want to see <laughs> Robert Shea act. We can leave that to it. It's his sister, right? Lynn Shea. Lynn Shea's mm -hmm. his sister, right? Yeah. yeah. Leave yeah. it. Leave it to her. Yeah. Leave the acting to her. Yeah. All right. So let's start with uh, Mark Patton as Jesse Walsh. In 1982, he landed a role on Broadway opposite Cher, Sandy Dennis, Kathy Bates. And Karen Black playing a gay character, Joe Qualley. The play, uh, written by Ed Gresick and directed by Robert Altman, was adapted into the film of the same name, 
come back to the five and dime Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean in 1982, which launched his, his Hollywood career. The following year, he starred in Anna to the Infinite Power and appeared in a made for television movie, Kelsey's Son, and al alongside Chuck Connors. Two years later, he landed the role in A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Patton, who had felt like an outsider and endured bullying at school, had been out about his homosexuality in New York, but Hollywood was a different, very homophobic world, he said. After appearing in Nightmare 2, the public began to notice a gay subtext in the movie, which screenwriter David Chaskin purposely included in the script. At the time, he denied it, blaming Patton for playing it, quote unquote, too gay. Tired of the homophobia in Hollywood that was so different than the theater scene in New York, Patton left acting and became a successful interior decorator. Oh, wow. and good for him. Yeah, and there's like a big uh, documentary that he did a couple of years, like uh, a couple of years ago, maybe like five or five or ten years ago, that he talks about the the effect that doing this movie had on him and and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to venture to that further, you're more than welcome. I'm like, I wasn't going to dig. There's a lot on the internet about that uh, part of the movie, but we won't get into it too much here. But no, different podcast. Yes. Um, but I will say he was not a very good actor, at least not in this. Like he didn't, it didn't, whether it's his yeah. acting or the directing, it just didn't, it didn't translate very well. I don't know. Most of the acting wasn't great in this. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know who to blame either. <laughs> Cause I mean, did, did really, I mean, yeah, I know Marshall Bell kind of mm -hmm. became kind of a character actor. Yeah. But did really anyone become anything i mean the no. friend the friend had done weird science before this right right yeah yep yeah yep so, they came out the same year but he was filming he had he was filming that when he auditioned for this one okay yeah we'll get to that we'll get and to I that know, in a minute yeah well, go ahead then. I'll let you okay. talk about the other actors. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, I don't think anybody did anything after. No, this, right? I mean, my my cast list for this is very short because there was very little. Well, it's a very short cast. Yeah, it's a very short cast. But even like some of the minor roles that I would typically say, oh, they were in this or they were in that, weren't in anything. So, <laughs> well, uh, Ferris Bueller's dad. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's in there. That's about all you get. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, but believe it or not, the main contenders for the role of Jesse were Mark Patton, Christian Slater and Brad Pitt. Pitt lost the role as he was deemed too nice by the producers. So they went okay. with uh, Mark Patton instead. Interesting choices. Yeah. But they didn't yeah. regret that one. Yeah. <laughs> then you've got Kim Myers as Lisa Weber. This was her first major role. She also made Letters from a Killer in 98 with Pat Patrick Swayze. In 89, she had her first TV role in a series called Studio 5B as Samantha Hurley. Then in 1993, she was in Key West. Later, she got a recurring role on The Pretender. <laughs> Not a movie. She was just, she was yeah. in Key West. Yeah, that was a, time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a TV show, Key West. I don't remember the yeah. show at all. Uh, the Pretender in 96, she also had notable TV guest appearances in Walker, show. Texas Ranger, and Six Feet Under. Both hey. Patton and uh, co-star Robert Rustler were allowed to sit on on the casting of Lisa Kim Myers was chosen because, according to director Shoulder, she looked like a young Meryl Streep, which is I I could see that immediately. I can see that, but that being your reason for it, it wasn't <laughs> about her talent or no anything. No. It's just she she looked like Meryl Streep, and she wasn't bad. I'll say of of Doing the act, yeah if, of the actors in most of the scenes, she's okay. a little a little <laughs> bit better than everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Not no, great with her. I will say with her, I think it's more the writing. Yeah, yeah. It, like yeah. the whole, the whole just randomly giving her this where she's a spiritualist. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel anything? Just, do you feel yeah. anything? <laughs> I believe you really are connected. Right. Right. Yeah. It's just you know I'm fine with that type of character in mm -hmm. a movie like this, but they just like randomly gave her this characteristic. Yeah, and it just it felt so forced and mm -hmm. didn't feel like it was actually a part of that or should it be a mm -hmm. part of that character? It was weird. And there's a lot of pieces that don't connect, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit. With well, let's talk. I'll need to talk about Robert Rustler, and then we'll get back to that. So Robert Rustler is Ron Grady. Once again, a name I would never pick out his name anywhere, but that uh, as his nemesis who becomes his friend. Uh, he yeah, made that's his film weird debut. Too. Yeah. 
He made his film deb debut, as we mentioned, in Weird Science in 85. He was also in Vamp in 86. He starred as Tommy Hook in oh, right skate skateboarding cult film Thrashin in 86 and as Buzz in the 1989 film Shag. Um, so he auditioned for the role on the last day of filming Weird Science. Robert Downey Jr. actually drove him to the audition. Oh, well, look at that. Good good for Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, yeah. So the relationships in this movie don't make any sense. Nope. First of all, Jesse just moved in and she's like already his best friend but there's no but then she just claims that he's just her ride to school right but there's no like how did they meet what nope. did you know like not a moving in day story or like oh, i remember when i met you the first day and da, da, da. like none of that they're just like instantly friends or that she rides to school with but of course everybody yeah. thinks that they're dating um so yeah and then her and her friend are kind of making fun of him yeah but she and really then, likes him. Yeah. And then yeah. Ron is clearly the bully. But and right. then I love I love that moment. It's like, what's your problem with me, dude? Yeah. I, I don't have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So, so we're best friends now? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Awesome. I mean, they go from like putting a snake on him while he's asleep in the science class. Which, how did again, they do that? Like, yeah, I still I, don't understand how they I did don't that. Because when I saw the snake, I'm like, oh, he's dreaming. And no, then yeah. he's not. You know, so I'm like... Yeah, all the students around it didn't snicker or anything when yeah. they went and put Teacher the snake on. didn't notice that. Right, right. Yeah. And then why didn't they get in trouble for snickering and laughing when he was getting ridiculed? But anyway. Uh, but yeah, but then like he's as... But it's like there's some scenes they're friends and some scenes they're not. And it's like they kept, it, there was like... it made Their relationship made no sense whatsoever. No, none of it. Yeah, none of it. Well, even the character of Jesse himself, like it starts off and you're thinking, okay, he's the dweeb. He's the right, you know, right. the nerd. He's the outcast. But then as soon as pretty much him and Ron have their relationship mm -hmm. as friends, it's more like, oh, he's just the dopey friend. Like he's, he's just one of the guys like mm -hmm. everybody else. And oh, look, they're all sitting together now at lunch. Yeah. And yeah right. Nobody is saying anything. <laughs> Then we've got Marshall Bell as Coach Schneider, the most weird part of this movie, I will say. Uh, Bell's movie debut was the role of Ronsky in Alan Parker's drama Birdie in 84. His first major role was this in Nightmare on Elm Street 2. He also played Mr. Lachance, Gordy's grieving father, in Stand By Me in 86. The ruthless hitman Webster and the comedy Twins in 88. Uh, George, who, who was the mutant Martian resistance leader, Kuato, Kuato? Kato, I don't remember. Attached Quato, to a stomach. Quato, yeah. yeah. And uh, Total Recall with Arnold Total Schwarzenegger. Recall. Yep. His mini TV guest appearances include Hill Street Blues, Wise Guy, Tales from the Crypt, The X Files, Millennium, Deadwood, and House. Uh, okay, I got I got to mention the two that I immediately know him from. Yes. Uh, on top of some of the ones you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, Starship Troopers. Yes. Yes. And then he is in a uh, virus, which I primarily <laughs> yes. know because it's based on a comic book. I've covered and, it on the show. Yes. Before. Uh, funny story. Tyra started watching that. It was on one of the free like streaming channels or whatever, like a couple weeks uh, ago. I came. How in, long she, until she regretted it? Like twenty minutes. She was like, "Nah, yeah. I gave up." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's like, "I haven't ever seen this. All these people." And I was like, "Trust me." If went, she's like, she got. She's like, "Oh, I've seen this before. It's terrible." And she cut it off. So I was like, "I, I was like, yeah, we had to watch it a couple months ago for." On the Laramie's podcast, but yeah, I forgot he was in that until you mentioned. It. I was like, "Oh, that's right, he mm -hmm. was in that too." Yeah, it's such a forgettable movie, or I want to forget that movie. But anyway, and then of course we got Robert England as Freddy Krueger, also the bus driver at the beginning. Him out outside of his makeup, which I thought was kind of cool to see. That. I like those. Yeah, yeah. A uh, New Line Cinema originally thought to save money by simply using an unnamed extra in a rubber mask to play Freddy as had been the case for masked mute impersonal killers like Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers, but reconsidered when they realized that the man, that the man had the gait and posture of quote unquote, a dime store monster or Frankenstein's monster, as opposed to Robert England's classically trained physical acting. The extra as Freddie still remained in one scene left in the film during coach Schneider's death scene in the shower, though obscured by excessive water steam. Realizing their mistake, the producers quickly brought back England for the rest of the film and series. So they also they didn't want to pay his his manager wanted more money for the sequel oh, yeah. and they didn't want to pay him. And then when they realized they couldn't make it without him, they brought him back. Well, that's typically why those classic horror movies completely ignore the uh, the ones that came before it. It mm -hmm. was 
It's because, dang it, you know, if we're going to bring somebody back, they're going to want more money. So let's just <laughs> ignore that they they survived right. and they because I I know this from um, documentaries and all that I've seen about the Nightmare that he Heather Langenkamp wasn't even approached to no. do this. Like, there was nope. no consideration mm -hmm. of bringing her back. Right. They wanted to tell a totally different story. They thought that, uh, and they did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And boy, what a what a decision that was. But yeah, uh, but yeah, I'm not going to go much into his filmography. We covered him in the first Nightmare on Elm Street, so you can go back and listen to that episode. His as well. filmography is Freddy Krueger. Nightmare on Street. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> he was on the TV show V. That was where he. I know he's. I know he's done other stuff. Robert England yeah. is great. I love Robert England, yeah. but he is forever oh, tied yeah. to being Freddy Krueger. Immortalized. So. Immortalized. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, as you mentioned before, Lyman Ward is Mr. Grady, his little cameo there playing Brody. Ron. 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 I want to call him Brody for some reason. He just looks like a Brody to me. <laughs> uh, Ron, Ron's dad. Uh, of course, he's most well known as Ferris Bueller's father and Beverly Hills. I mean, Beverly Hills. I Ferris mean, Bueller's day off. Sorry, I was reading ahead. Let me start over. Of course, he's most famous for playing Ferris Bueller's dad and Ferris Bueller's day off in 86. One interesting thing to note was, he was originally cast in 1990 as Jim Walsh in the pilot episode of Beverly Hills 90210. Producers later recast the role, and his scenes were cut and reshot with James Eckhouse. I never knew that until today. Mm. Uh, he was also he made a cameo appearance in the movie Not Another Teeny Movie. I'm sorry, Not Another Teen Movie as Mr. Wyler spoofing his role in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He also played a minor role in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles in '87 as John, one of the marketers who worked with Steve Martin's character. That is correct. I so, remember yeah. that. That was funny when he popped up. I was like, it's Mr. Bueller. Yeah. And then uh, not someone that really has a filmography. Well, I, I just mentioned this. This is kind of a last of the casting. Joanne Willett is one of the girls seated in the back of the school bus driven by Freddie at the beginning of the film. She appeared in the ABC sitcom Just the Ten of Us that started in 87, a program uh, which not only featured Heather references. Lincoln. Yeah. Yep, I just said, uh, you just said Heather Lennon from the first and seventh films. Brooke, another person on the cast was Brooke Thice, who was in the fourth film. So mm -hmm. the one, the the uh, weightlifting girl that gets turned into a yeah. cockroach. That's it. Yep. Yep. So just the 10 of us and its connections to A Nightmare on Elm Street. Yes. I was a fan of just the 10 of us. I, I was I, too. I lie. really enjoyed that show. Yeah. I did. That was a fun show. I saw the uh, the guy that played the dad did some stand up as well. I used to see some of his stand up stuff. It was really funny. All right. So anybody else in the cast that I missed that needs to be? Oh, I think you've named everybody in the cast. <laughs> I I don't think there's any. I mean, there's yeah, there's Jesse's, the mom. Yeah, Jesse's, Jesse's mom, and, mom dad. and dad. Yeah, but, pretty forgettable. Yeah, and his sister I think went on to be a soap opera star. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think you take care it. of everybody. That's everybody. Yeah. Anybody in the cast that you would. I'm not even gonna ask that question. We're moving on. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say anybody in the cast that you enjoyed or liked, but I know that answer is already Robert done. England. That was it. Robert yeah. England. That's it. That's it. All right. Well, let's move into iconic scenes, favorite scenes. Is there an iconic scene? If someone said Time on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, what's the first scene that pops into your head? So for me, I honestly think the opening, the bus okay. uh, yeah. scene. Um I will say the shot of Freddie at the pool party when he does the, you're all my children now, like mm -hmm. that is a cool scene, a cool shot. And I know it's used a lot when they do like, you know, documentaries or specials mm -hmm. about just the series as a whole. Right. Uh, that that's one that's, but, but that's pretty, I mean, again, I'm such a big fan. I can think of everything, but I think if you're, you're to say, like knee jerk, what's the first thing that comes to mind? It's just, it's that opening bus scene. And that's, I would say about it. Yeah. For me, it's uh Freddie coming out of Jesse's yeah, body. I was, him, yeah. I thought about that. That's, that's probably the only scene that when it got to that part of the movie, it was like, Ooh, I remember this. Like yeah, if I, I did see like it before. It. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah. But it was cool. I mean, it's a cool scene, even though it doesn't fit the yeah. mythology. At well, all. it's, it's, I mean, you might as well have called the movie, you know, like uh, a, a, an American werewolf on Elm Street uh, <laughs> with that scene. You know, it, it's Street to the possession. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very reminiscent of the yeah. transformation scene in uh, yeah. American Werewolf. So, right. Right. Yeah. But no, nah, man, I, I think 
Yes, I do agree with you, but I just try to avoid that because it's just <laughs> it's part of what makes this movie so bad. Right. It's problematic. Uh any so any favorite scenes you have or any scene that you kind of enjoyed? <laughs> well, I mean, I do even though it's happening in the real world and all. I I, I have actually I love how I'm going to call this. I always love calling death scenes, favorite scenes, yeah. but we typically do. And in, in we're talking about, a lot yeah, of movies. but I will say, you know, Ron's death is one of, you know, the putting it through the door mm -hmm. and the father seeing it. Yeah. You know, that, that works for me. I, I like that. But other than that, yeah, I don't know. I absolutely hate the pool scene. So mm -hmm. everything about the pool scene is bad. So I can't give it to any of that. And yeah, the the death of the coach is just so oh, yeah. Stupid and weird. It, it, yeah, that that whole sequence just makes no sense. No. At all. Mm -mm. He, did he literally walk there in his pajamas? Right, right. Uh how did he get in? I mean, I get it, it's the eighties, you know. It's a CD I, bar, there's not really bouncers yeah. or people asking for ID. Yeah. Yeah, but the fact that no one's thinking anything because he's supposed to be a <laughs> high school student. Right, right. And then I get the Freddy's supposed to be in control there, so maybe it's it's fr how Freddy knows, but yeah, how does he know the coach is there? And then once the coach is there, why is his initial thought of let me take you back to the high school? Yes, and have you run laps. And have you run laps, yeah. And then send you to the showers. But then, yeah. But then, yeah. He, you know, you've sweat a lot tonight. Let Let's go take a shower. <laughs> but while then, I go into my office and then curiously look at yes, look at these sports the sports equipment that's flying off the walls. Right. And which yeah, once again goes back to the how did Freddie become paranormal all of a sudden? It's just that you know I'm saying yeah, Freddie yeah. is a poltergeist in this. Mm -hmm. that's, he's not Freddy Krueger. Yeah. I don't I don't like it. <laughs> Yeah, that was definitely a scene I wanted to talk about because I was like, this this make what well, I, I want to talk about, it, but didn't want to talk about it. But the the whole him in his office and all the sports equipment jumping off the shelves and kind of and then getting picked up by the, the uh, jump, ropes. jump ropes and yeah. being dragged. It just it's all problematic. Which, which again leads me to question what is Freddie doing? And is Freddie this supernatural? Okay, great. Is Freddy the one dragging him in there? Or is it supposed to be Jesse dragging him in there? I'm still confused. I don't so, think so, yeah. Look, just I'm just going to say it one more time. This movie's horrible. And <laughs> I'm just going to leave. You can just loop that. And every time you want to talk to me and the rest of the... Just, just play that just over and over again. Just me going, this movie's horrible. Yeah, this might be the shortest episode we do because I think we're almost done. <laughs> well, the movie's only an hour and a half, so... Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, well, let's talk about some scenes and trivia. I don't, I don't really have any favorite scenes at all. Um, yeah, the opening bus scene is kind of, you know, it starts off kind of decent. Like I, you know, I was kind of into it at the beginning, and then it just goes off the rails. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just bad. It's just bad. I also, I also love the oh, and hey, we're all of a sudden now out in the desert in Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's but that's how I knew it was a dream. dream yeah, that yeah was, it's a dream sequence. So, okay. That was, oh, oh, okay. The other thing I want to talk about. What's the deal when she goes to the factory where he used to work? The dogs, the with, dogs the, with the, with the human, human faces. faces and no, Yeah. And are they real? Are they? Right. That's what, like she must be dreaming mm -hmm. now. Or is, or is Freddie manifesting this for her to see? This movie's horrible. <laughs> There's, People aren't going to know when you're actually looping that in versus <laughs> me actually saying it. Well, so, well, at home, it's, if you're a drinker, it's a drinking game now. Every time he yeah. says it, take a shot. This movie's horrible. As I take a sip of my water. If it was a video podcast, we'd have a little timer on the, in the corner yeah. that would go off. A little counter. Or the counter, yeah. Like, every time. So, yeah. Let's just like, and then the giant rat attacking the smaller rat. Yeah. Like, yeah. That yeah. doesn't make any sense. Sense. Oh, and of course, we didn't talk about the the possessed parakeets. First of all, who has parakeets as pets? Who wants to talk about the possessed <laughs> parakeets? No, possess. Yeah, one. The other one immediately dead as soon as they yes. they're immediately dead. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then the other one is flying around, and I love how we get the bird's eye perspective. Yes, uh, yeah. 
of it attacking and then yeah just poof. and then and dad's initial reaction you did it with a cherry bomb <laughs> <laughs> how would that work dad yeah like, and then i love it how like it's really hot in here it's set on 97 i believe that you would know it's hot before it gets to 97 i mean when my house yeah. gets gets to 80 i know something's wrong 80 good <laughs> lord it's 72 i'm already going it's oh yeah too hot yeah too hot i love though that right after he, he goes it's 97 in here right. and then immediately just takes the thermostat <laughs> off the wall yeah <laughs> and he's but yeah, I love how mom mom says something about like it's so hot in here, and he goes, mm -hmm. "Oh, let me check it." And he gets up, and his shirt is just drenched. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you didn't think to check it earlier, right. Dad. You're well. I did notice in the earlier scene when I think when Jesse's trying to leave to go to the go to the pool, I guess, and his dad's like, "You can't leave until the room gets you know all the boxes get unpacked." But he's fanning himself with like the TV guide or whatever. So I'm assuming yeah. that it's already setting up the, the house is warmer than normal because yeah. well, i mean they do that Freddy right off there the, right yeah. off the bat when jesse wakes up and jesse talks mm, he's about, always sweating yeah it's it's so hot in that room i can't get a good night's sleep and mm -hmm. mom says yeah you need to check the ac <laughs> there's love, nothing wrong with the ac <laughs> i love how he's he's pulling tell me move this oven it's something with the gas your mother smelled gas i said i thought i smelled gas I'm like oh, well gosh. then what was it woman <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's there's so i don't know if i'd call it stereotypical but there's mm. there's there's so cliched parents yes in this. yes very cliched very cliched all right let's show and, the and, scenes and, and hey, if okay. you want to hold on if you want to throw in some randomness let's throw in the uh Go the for completely it. the completely you have the opportunity to create your own fake cereal for this yeah. movie <laughs> and you go with the most racist cereal mm, yeah you could think of and call it Fu man chews mm -hmm. there was nothing else you could think of for how to get these long fingernails inside of the the cereal which by the way why, why don't they put stuff inside cereal boxes anymore yeah i'm I miss that. I miss yeah. that my kids don't get to experience that. Mm -hmm. But man, of I all the things you could choose from, <laughs> you go with Fu Man Chews. Yeah, yeah. That's why I think maybe he was maybe he thought he was making a comedy. Maybe that's what happened. Mm -mm. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later about one of the scenes that he couldn't. He had to have the assistant director film because he wouldn't stop laughing. If you haven't read that one already. But scenes and trivia, this movie takes place five years after the first Nightmare on Street, which makes sense because it seems like nobody in the town really remembers what happened there, which, seems, which still seems kind of weird. crazy. Yeah. Because yeah. he even makes a comment. Like, you know, it's like, oh, it was before my time. I'm thinking, was this 20 years ago? Like, no, <laughs> no. I mean, Lisa flat out tells us when she um, gets the diary you know, mm -hmm. five years ago or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, it like. We get that Jesse and his family are brand new, but the rest of you, <laughs> you were here five years ago. Right, right. Did everybody move? Yeah, so. I'm sorry. Y'all know it. Mm -hmm. Your parents know it. Your, everybody knows what happened. It, you're, Springwood's supposed to be a small town here. Right. The mother got sucked through a door. We saw that in the first one. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was for you. The original glove from A Nightmare on Elm Street was used in this movie and was also seen hanging on the wall of the work shed in Evil, Evil Dead. Dead 2. Yep, Evil Dead this, 2, but yeah, this, Evil yeah, Dead. This was in response to the use of the Evil Dead on a television screen in the first Nightmare on Elm Street and part of a continued banter between directors Wes Craven and Sam Raimi. However, when Wes Craven loaned the glove to the Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warrior set, it was lost, but eventually found by a Freddy fan, Mike Becker, at an auction in 2009. Quotation marks around found. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I believe there. Well, look, it just happened to turn up. I don't hey, know look, I, I just happened to find this laying here. Right. Had the film failed, New Line Cinema might not have survived. The movie hit big enough to finally give the studio some cash flow. And in the Seriously. following years, New Line Cinema rode the Elm Street train to further success and had a hit with another horror series, Critters, that came out in 86. Uh, cranked out John Waters movies and turned into both a respectable and profitable mini major studio during the 90s. 
However, all of that was uncertain back when the film was being made. Studio head Robert Shea micromanaged every aspect of the production, regularly confusing crew members by stepping over the line and offering orders which should have come from the director. That led to an understandably uneasy relationship between Shea and Jack Shoulder. On top of this, the production was remarkably rushed, slotted for a November 1st release, when the first film had only been released on November 9th of the previous year. As a result, tensions were high, the hours were long, and the work was hard. There was no real time to stop and second guess the direction of the film. In the Never Sleep Again documentary, Robert Englund recalls several moments during filming, such as the pool sequence where Freddie appears to teenagers outside of their dreams, where he struggled with playing the part because so much of it felt like it was going against the rules that were set in the first installment. The course, whole thing about. goes against the rules. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, and here's what I mentioned earlier. Jack Shoulder couldn't direct the pool house love scene without cracking up are laughing, so he gave it to an assistant to direct instead. Okay. Should have told you something. If you can't keep a straight face and it's not a comedy, there's a problem. Yeah. I mean, the the Freddy tongue coming out yeah. and then yeah. him having to shove it back in. I mean, that's, that's pretty funny, but... Yeah. As Jesse transforms into Freddy, we see a quick shot of Freddy's eye staring out of Jesse's open mouth. To accomplish the shot, effects artists made a dummy of Mark Patton's head with a hole for Freddy's eye to look through. They then affixed this prop to a flat surface and had someone put their head into the opening. The only person whose head could fit was the girlfriend of special effects designer, Kevin Yeager. It's the only time in the series that Freddy is portrayed by a woman, not counting the times he pretended to be other people in the dream world. Okay. And the last doesn't, one I'll mention doesn't here. doesn't change anything. This movie is horrible. No, no. Despite the film's title, it's never revealed upon whom Freddy is seeking his revenge. And a Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy got back at several parents who burned him alive for murdering their children. But in this sequel, the Walsh family just moved in and have nothing to do with either the original death nor his demise in the first movie. <laughs> so, yep. And again, apparently nobody remembers any of this. Right. Right. Even though, again, just like in the in the first movie, there's obviously Heather's or Nancy's uh, mm -hmm. parents who remember the original you know, Fred Krueger, who, mm -hmm. you know, killed children. And so that also nobody. Right. Nobody knows that anymore. That's something that we're just going to. OK, like Lisa has to do extra work to find out <laughs> about all this. Right. Yeah. You think being a small town, that would be like pretty common knowledge. Yeah. But this movie is horrible. There we go. And now these messages. <sighs> what seems to be the problem, pal? There's just so much pain in the world, so many issues. I don't think I can bear it. Well, friendo, it sounds like you could use a dose of pop culture roulette. Pop culture roulette? What's that? Some sort of pop culture themed podcast or something? That's right, sonny boy. When hope seems far, dive into some PCR. But I already get my entertainment news from Variety. Huh, that's pretty good. If you're a chucklehead, PCR gives you news you need, condensed, unfiltered, and raw, from three nerds who know a little something about something. Wow, okay, sign me up. That's the spirit. Pop Culture Roulette. New episodes every Monday, available on all major podcast directories. Curious about how you can achieve smooth, natural-looking, long-lasting filler results? The Juvederm Collection of Fillers has six unique gel fillers that add subtle volume and are designed for different needs in specific areas of the face, like lips, cheeks, chin, smile lines, under eyes, and jawline. Ask your licensed specialist for a full face assessment today and download the Alley app. That's A-L-L-E, the official loyalty program of Juvederm, to save on treatments and get a look that's true to you. For important safety information and to find a licensed specialist, visit Juvederm.com. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Not for people with severe allergic reactions, allergies to lidocaine, or the proteins used in Juvederm. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. There's a risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. Talk to a licensed specialist to find out if it's right for you. Your teen requested a ride, but this time not from you. It's through their Uber teen account. 
You drive your teenager around a lot to their friend Jacob's house, their other friend Jake's house, to James's, to Jaden's, to Jalen's, to. Oh, uh, mom, this is Jake's house, not Jacob's. Now with an Uber Teen account, your teen can request a ride under your supervision. They'll ride with a highly rated driver, and with live trip tracking, you'll follow along the whole ride to their friends' houses that all sound the same. Add your teen to your Uber account today. See app for details. Bye, mom. All right, wrapping it up. Box office and critical reception. A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, was released in North American theaters on Friday, November 1st, 1985. It landed at number four at the box office its opening weekend, unable to top the two other new releases, Death Wish 3 at number one and To Live and Die in L.A. at number two. I've never even heard of that second one. Oh, yeah. it's I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. In the it's US, crazy that they, would, they released this the day after Halloween. Yeah. It's crazy. In the U.S., the film eventually made $30 million on a budget of $3 million. This movie looks like a $3 million budget movie. The first movie wasn't made on a lot of movie. I mean, a lot of money. But it still looked better. Like, this yes. one just looked like a cheap... I mean, it was a cash grab sequel. Everything looks cheaper. Everything looks rushed. The hot dogs exploding look like something out of a Ghostbusters movie. Yeah. <laughs> now that you mentioned that, I was like, there was something at the end. So... I got another Ghostbusters vibe at the end as well. When, when he's peeling Freddy yes. off of him. Yes. The, yeah. The same yeah. way that Sir Gorney Weaver and Rick mm-hmm. Moranis come out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, they no, just, the, the they hot just dogs, stole from everything. <laughs> yeah. The hot dogs popping is just like the eggs in, mm-hmm. uh, in Ghostbusters. The yep. eggs cooking on the, the counter. Yeah, this movie is horrible. <laughs> Ding. All right, so Rotten Tomatoes it's got a 43% on the tomato meter and a 33% audience score. IMDb, 5.3 out of 10 with viewers, which is higher than I expected, mm-hmm. and 43 on Metacritic. One of the few times that Metacritic and tomato meter are exactly the same at 43. Yeah, I'm, g- I'm good with 30s. Yeah. 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 40 is starting to push it. This but... one's pretty terrible. Yeah. This might be the lowest rated movie we've covered so far. Oh, wow. I've covered so far. Not you, not you. Not, not that I've <laughs> covered. I've done. I've done plenty. I did barbed wire, so. right? And I've been on most of those. So, uh, yeah. thank you for choosing me, sir. No problem. <laughs> All right. Anything else we want to say about this movie besides this movie is horrible? It's horrible. <laughs> uh, I got a question for you. Sure. Is it because you and I kind of talked about this before we started recording? Mm-hmm. Is this worse than Season of the Witch? Ooh, that's a good question. Oh gosh! Because yeah, because Halloween, you got season. Yeah. Even though that was the third one, but yeah. you've got the one bad, just rotten apple of the series. This is clearly the rotten apple of yeah. the series for Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street. Uh, just and I would think Friday the Thirteenth is probably five. I would say five. Yeah, five is pretty would, bad. Would be the rotten apple. I will say this: every Friday the Thirteenth movie is still better than Season <laughs> of the Witch and and this Freddy's movie. Revenge. But is Freddy's Revenge worse than Season of the Witch? I don't think so. Okay. And it's not it's not by much, but only because at least in this one, you got Freddy. You get Freddy. And yeah, that's a good point. That he's not great. Point. He's not as good he's as he's not Freddy. Else. He's not the Freddy we want, but, but he's you still got Freddy. Freddy. You at least got yeah. Freddy. Whereas Season of the Witch, good. you don't get any Michael Myers. It's it's all a big letdown from the beginning. No, um, but we got an awesome jingle with Silver Shamrock. Yeah, yeah. And we don't even get the actual Freddy music in this movie. Either. Nope. That was my trivia. I skipped over that one. Yeah. yeah. We did get the, uh, the, the, the kids doing the chant thing though. Yeah. Yeah. We, Which we, was we totally out of place. You know, he opens the yep. door there they are and that's it. Yeah. So yeah, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. It's better than season of the witch just because it is still actually a part of the franchise and yeah. not just a random. Yep. I'll give you that. All right. Yeah. This movie is still horrible. <laughs> All right, thanks, Emery. What's going on with uh, moving panels? What you got coming up? Uh, so yeah, so we just uh, have been wrapping up our kind of tribute to the Olympics mm-hmm. uh, with our one shots, uh, talking about the golden, silver, and bronze age. Bronze age will be the the one that uh, should be coming out uh, right around the same time that uh, this episode is, and then uh, we're gonna do a uh, Olympic edition of Jeopardy, or more yes. like a sports sports edition of Jeopardy. <laughs> But uh, we, we got that, um, and then uh, we are ending out our season, our year, 
uh, uh, year four of moving panels ending at the end of August, uh, where you will uh, join me uh, to talk about Jonah Hex, talking about the the bad movies that we always do. Uh, we, Jonah Hex we, or Laramie's Revenge on Tim for. <laughs> Look, it is this is a tradition. This is it an is honor tradition. tradition. It is to it end is. end a year of moving panels with a bad movie, right? And you are the, so, one of the staple co-hosts, right? And so, so we did we did Bloodsport, we did uh, Bloodshot, Blood. Oh yeah, Bloodshot. Yeah, sorry, Bloodshot. Eighties movies. Yeah. You Blood do Bloodsport. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did Bloodshot. We did uh, Morbius. Was that we've done? Yeah, we did Morbius. I think but Nicholas actually Nicholas, Nicholas did Nicholas, one of them. He did the Hulk with me. Hulk, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So that was the other end of the year bad movie. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, you are you will get a you will get Jonah Hex this this time. And then and then we're kicking into year five of movie panels after that, starting in September. Very cool. Very, very cool. Yes. I love it. Podcasts. It's what it's all about. Helping each other, supporting each other. So definitely go listen to moving panels if you haven't already. It's much more enjoyable films than this one. Most of them are anyway. Sometimes. Have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. But, yeah. But if you love comics, love comic book movies, it's definitely the show for you. So go check it out for sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap on this episode of the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. If you had a blast listening to us, we deeply appreciate it. If you could take a moment and share your glowing feedback with a shiny five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Remember to hit that follow or subscribe button and help us spread the word to all your fellow 80s flick loving enthusiasts. If you have any burning questions or want to chat about your favorite scenes, reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also show your love and support for the show at buymeacoffee.com. Every little bit makes a difference. Even $5 a month goes a long way. Also, be sure to swing by our online store at 80sflickflashback.com and tpublic.com for some killer 80s flick flashback gear and original 80s inspired designs. Thank you, Laramie, for joining. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This is Tim Williams for the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. You've got the body. I've got the brains. This movie's horrible. (laughs) You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.